Yeah, I had an electric eel. It actually, uh, it was in Scientific American Magazine. They flew out, this National Geographic photographer uh, flew out to my, my, my fish room. Um, yeah, I had an, I've, I've had everything. If you name off some fish, I'll tell you, I've had them and a bunch of facts about them. <laughs> so how, how does one get an electric eel? Is that something that would be wild caught as well or? Yes, wild caught, but they're just seasonal. Um, you talk to the right fish store, uh, they'll be able to find them. Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, I'm speaking with Nick Tobler. You may have seen him on either Instagram or TikTok. His channel and his his platforms are absolutely blowing up right now. He is a longtime reptile keeper and fish keeper, but the reason that he's going viral right now is he has recently converted a under his basement cistern into what he's calling an eel pit, essentially a giant cave style aquarium. And it is incredible. So he's, he's done the, a series of videos on TikTok and Instagram that people have been completely amazed by. And I saw one of the videos and I thought, okay, I have to have him on, especially because he's a reptile keeper as well. So in the episode, we discuss w- what he's keeping, his history with keeping fish and reptiles. And he talks a little bit about his current breeding project with Indian star tortoises. But of course, the majority of this conversation is about how he converted this under the basement cistern into an eel pit, a functioning filtered eel pit and how he got American eels and how he acquired American eels and and the other fish that he currently has in there. It's an absolutely mind-blowing conversation. I had a blast chatting with him. Before we jump into the episode, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. There you'll find the show notes for all episodes that have been released, including the new show, the new podcast that's currently on the network. That is Liam Sinclair and Ellie Hill's the Reptile Research Podcast. You can find that on animalsathomenetwork.com as well. If you would like to join us on Patreon, you can do that for as little as $3 a month over at patreon.com slash animalsathome. Thank you so much for Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Again, an amazing project with them is happening in the next couple of weeks. So if you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, definitely do so so you don't miss that. And I think we're going to jump into this episode. Enjoy. Well, Nick, welcome to the podcast. I'm really excited to chat with you today. Yeah, should be a good time. You have the Instagram and TikTok handle of someone who probably didn't expect to go viral. Is, is, that's from my point of view. Is that, is that true? Uh, I've always used it and I came up with it in like middle school probably. So it's, it's like cow turtle. and It's just, yeah. Worth. And then like every time I like, I should change that. It's like, ah, well, I've been going this long with it. So, well, it's much too late at this point. So I want to talk about your whole story because it's uh, really fascinating and it's just lately, it seems like it's just blowing up across the internet. So we'll get into that, but, but also even beyond this viral sensation, you actually seem like you are an animal lover and an animal keeper and you've been keeping exotics and reptiles and fish for a long time. So how did you get into an interest in animals to begin with? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, so I've always been doing it. Um, ever since I was a kid, I'd be catching snakes, frogs, uh, fish, creek chubs, whatever I could, uh, catch down in the woods. Um, then I'd bring them home, keep them. Um, just always. Yeah. I mean, that's going back fifth grade. I don't know. Probably mm-hmm. before that, even catching toads. Do you remember the first animals that you actually kept? Was it fish or reptiles? Um, Oh, probably in fourth or fifth grade. I had a goldfish tank, mm-hmm. um, red eared sliders pretty early on. Um, I had a tree frog at one point, but I barely remember that. And, and what are you keeping now besides the, the eel pit? We'll leave that for later. Mm-hmm. Oh, I've got all kinds of stuff. So my main, uh, my absolute main thing is fish. Um, my dream fish, dream animal in the entire world is the Australian lungfish I got last year. Um, Super cool species. I'm actually going to Chicago to see some full grown ones at the shed aquarium this week. Um, but yeah, the Australian lungfish is like my, my dream animal. I also have uh, two other species of lungfish, uh, the guild African lungfish. They're another kind of rare one. Um, and then the South American lungfish. Um, that's my fish upstairs. Then uh, reptile wise, the, uh, our absolute main thing is breeding Indian star tortoises. Um, we, uh, we raised our, uh, the mother of all of them, um, from a two week old baby. Um, she just had her first clutch this year. Um, and we're up to 16 eggs and I think 12 have hatched so far. Wow. That's awesome. Very cool. Mm -hmm. As far as the lungfish with how big do those get? They get pretty big, right? Yes. So the Australian lungfish will get massive. Um, I expect three foot, 
Um, four foot's possible. Five foot's like wild, absolute massive one. Mm. Um, but like the Shedd Aquarium, they're, uh, they actually just confirmed the age of their um, the oldest living aquarium fish they, that they had that died. Um, and it was 109 years old. Um, and wow. I don't think it was even four foot um, at that age. So it's possible, but I'm not expecting it to get bigger than four foot. So this is something that I talk about quite often in on the podcast just to do with the reptile world. And, and you would kind of have a, a thought about this with l- keeping larger fish and even the tortoises that are long lived and, and they're not huge, but, you know, in, Indian star tortoises get a decent size is keeping these larger species, you know, that... I think in the reptile world, we see this a lot, lots of big species being kept in small, small enclosures. And in the fish world, we see it too, you know, arowana and whatnot. So, so where do you sit on that? Do you think that if you're going to be keeping these large species, they need to have large space or or how how does that sit for you? Yeah, I think the fish world is worse than anything. Um, Okay. Well, that's, and people go for like Paku and red tailed catfish stuff. That's like, why even bother? Like it's, (laughs) it's, it's not that cool for the amount of space it needs. Um, like, and it's like, amazing they, how big like a Paku gets, right? Like people yeah, don't realize I, how huge they get. Just, I, I don't think I've uploaded any videos officially, um, besides my story, but I actually swam with some wild Paku down in blue Springs in Florida. And yeah, they're, I mean, they're footballs swimming around and they're three <laughs> feet long. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I can get one out of pet store for $5. Yeah. It's, 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 um, it just doesn't seem right. No, no. And that's, that's something I really, really don't like. That is so common. Um, cause like things like arapaima are available also, but I feel the people keeping arapaima that I've met, I feel better about than the people keeping Paku, which mm-hmm. are smaller fish, but they're just so common and so popular. Um, arapaima aren't really commonly available. You can get one if you go out of your way to, um, but the people I know that have arapaima, like my friend Chase down in Lexington has the tank for an arapaima. Um, and I've been to Ohio fish rescue. Everyone I've seen with an arapaima has had the tank for it. Yeah, yeah. Ohio, uh, Ohio Fish Rescue deals with a lot of those big species that end up growing out tanks, right? And then he has, I mean, I don't know how many fish he has, but he has some monster fish tanks. And obviously he has the entire pool that he has a lot mm-hmm. of those animals in too. So what, what size of enclosure, or oh, sorry, enclosure, what size of tank will you eventually build up to the, for the Australian lungfish? So right now, and he's, he's maybe eight inches right now. Um, right now I'm setting up a 500 gallon aquarium. Um, it is eight foot by four foot by 30 inches tall. Um, and that'll last him probably the next 20 years. Okay. Um, I would love for him to get outgrow it and I'd love to go bigger. Um, and in 20 years, I mean, I did this in in less than a year, I've gotten the 500 and that'll, like I said, that'll last him 15, 20 years easy. Yeah. At least it's a slow growing and you have a lot of time to plan to, to get into a larger enclosure. And you mm-hmm. also have a Cayman lizard too. Yeah. So he's in a custom enclosure. Yeah. He's, uh, he's probably pushing 30 inches now. It's all tail. Um, but yeah, we've got a big, tall custom enclosure. It's probably seven foot tall. Um, I want to say by f- five foot wide, um, and then maybe two foot front to back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's another species that everybody loves, but it is a specialty species and they do need lots of space and they have, you know, aquatic region and whatnot. And it's not as simple as, you know, a bearded dragon or something. Yeah. We look forward to giving him a bigger enclosure here soon too. Um, we want to like a pond at the bottom and just wood above it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so tell me, so you have this animal interest, so you, that's been around, you know, your whole life, you've been keeping animals and whatnot. And then you also have this other interest, which is not really related to animals, which is like exploring underground caves and regions. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So I explore everything, uh, not just underground. I'll, I'll climb, climb skyscrapers, uh, whatever, uh, whatever we can do. Um, but yeah, I've always, well, the coolest part of this to me too, is like, I want to keep the animal and I want to keep it for its entire life. Um, but I also want to go see them in the wild. Mm. Um, so one of my dreams is I want to go to South America. I want to see the freshwater stingrays. Um, I want to visit Australia and I want to try to see the lungfish in the wild. Um, but yeah, those difficult um, animals to see, I mean, obviously you're not scuba diving a crystal clear, you know, reef in in those scenarios. It's that it's a really hit and miss. Um, and like the stingrays, it'd be probably just trying to net them. Like there are like tributaries of the Amazon that are clear. I've seen some amazing pictures from, uh, Ivan Mikolji is one of them. He's a, a photographer down in South America and he's actually got a good YouTube series, um, on Amazon fish. Um, so there are, there are places where you can snorkel with them, mm. but then also you run the risk of, you know, uh, crocodiles and all kinds of stuff down in South America. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Amen. So, so you have the interest of seeing them in the wild and then, and so I guess you're just an explorer in general. You like to explore unknown territory. Yeah, I like to combine it all. I want to see everything there is about life and all the, all the cool places that it exists. Um, mm-hmm. Caves fascinate me just because most animals in Kentucky, I can find like 
pretty close to my house, but like a cave animal, that's something like just wildly, wildly different than anything I'm used to experiencing out, out and about. Well, and there's something weird about caves because most people are not interested in going into caves at all. I mean, there's they're very claustrophobic. It's dark. It's wet. It's kind of creepy. And so it's kind of strange that you actually are attracted to those areas. Is it just because it's different or, or what, what brings yeah. you to them? Yeah, more more than anything, it's just different. Um, it's it's a really cool habitat, like rocky, wet. Um, it's really unique. Um, a cool bugs. Um, yeah, just everything about it. Like, I'm not a fan of spiders, but I want to see a cool spider still. Yeah, exactly. Um, cave fish, cave crayfish. I've never found them in the wild yet, um, but I'm, I, I do want to go see those um, over in Indiana here soon. Um, the cave cave fish and cave crayfish. Um, those are like, I, I I don't think I've even seen any true cave adapted species. Like I've seen spring salamanders that are like slightly cave adapted, um, but nothing like blind pigmentless, nothing yet. Is there lots of caves and whatnot in your area to go explore? Um, I live in Kentucky, but like disclaimer, it might as well be Ohio. Mm. Um, I live at like as far away from the caves as I can in Kentucky. So okay. it's about a two and a half hour drive to get to anywhere cool. Interesting. Okay, so that that layers us into this uh, conversation that we're going to have today because you have this animal interest and you have this cave interest and you have this viral story that's gone crazy in the last little bit of time. So why don't we just kind of, we'll, we'll run through this full story. Can you tell us how this whole thing started with with the eel pit? It sounds like you purchased a home and then you kind of, you can take it from there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, my brother got the house. Um, it was actually our grandparents' house. My brother bought it from my grandma. Um and i didn't even know the cistern was there it's a rainwater cistern so a week before we moved in it's like there's a manhole in the corner of the garage um i explore storm drains that's that's what i can explore in my area is storm drains um so that's something i do and you'll find all kinds of animals in storm drains too just like you would a cave Mm -hmm. um so it's like what's that uh and then i look down there and it's it's a huge room like uh, 22 foot by 12 foot um eight feet deep there was already two foot of standing water crystal clear standing water because it was undisturbed um, so I knew right away, well, that's a fish pond, um, free 5,000 gallon fish pond in our new house. <laughs> and, uh, it was, I, eels are something I've always wanted to do too. Um, and because they're native to, uh, the entire Eastern U S pretty much with their migration. Um, I I've always wanted to do an eel pond specifically because I could keep it in a tank, but it'd be a lot cooler to have an eel pond. Uh, the issue with an eel pond is that on rainy nights, uh, when they migrate, they'll actually climb over land. Um, so like my yard here, like ends into well woods with a Creek under it. So like if I had had them in a koi pond, they would escape one night. Um, but this is perfect where it's totally sealed up, no escape, um, huge, massive space, plenty of room for them. And, uh, yeah, it was, I mean, perfect setup for everything. Um, that was, that was one of the funniest things too, was like all my followers that have been following me for years. Like, I mean, like, like perfect setup, like it doesn't get better for you. Uh, my so, last post, my last post before I went viral was uh, me and my friend holding bats, like just playing with bats in a train tunnel. That's amazing. So d- before it went viral, what, did you just have a relatively normal followership in, as far as the social media goes? Yeah. Uh, YouTube, I, I built up over like eight years to like three, 4,000 subscribers. Um, then Instagram, I had 1,400 subscribers. Uh, and then TikTok only had 200 followers before uh, before the pit. Wow. That's crazy. And, and so getting back to just keeping eels in general, do people keep eels in fish tanks quite often or is that, cause that sounds like a more of a challenging species to keep. So American eels specifically, no, uh, almost no one keeps them. Um, there, there is like a native fish, like, uh, Nantha is the biggest one, but there is like native fish keepers around. Um, but even then like American eels aren't popular. They're known for like, you know, eating everything else in the tank, mm. uh, but it's only what fits in their mouth. So I like keeping bigger, larger, weird species. Um, so stuff that would do perfect alongside the eels. Um, you can find some old forum posts about them, but yeah, no one's really keeping them as a species. You you think of eels on on the, on the Marine side, people are keeping eels all the time, but you don't think of a lot of, you know, freshwater eels. So, so this cistern is something that's actually underground underneath. I think it's your garage, right? It's not, it's not under the basement. Yes. Yeah. It's not in the basement. Yeah. And so what did you have to do? Obviously you had a ton of modifications to make this thing fish ready. So maybe we can walk through some of the, the things that you had to do to it. Yeah, honestly, not much. Uh, Like I said, it was already holding water. Uh, First water test, like everything was perfect. Um, I did pump it and uh, drain it once or twice um, just to get the sediment out. And that's something I'm still kind of working on Um, is just the sediment from the shingles on the roof and just dust from it was probably unused for 20 years about. 
Um, so that's been the biggest thing. Um, but then the rest was just adding a filter, adding gravel, adding the cinder blocks. Um, the cinder blocks came with a challenge because they actually are mixed with lime, I believe, um, which really raises the pH of the water mm. way up. Um, like the pH of a cinder block is like 11 or 12. Oh, wow. Um, so I've been, uh, all the cinder blocks that went in, I've, uh, soaked them in muriatic acid for at least three days before they went in. So that was like the most time intensive part of it was just soaking those cinder blocks. Um, and also just transporting them in my car because it's a lot of cinder blocks I haven't counted. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and soaking them in muriatic acid is probably a lot of, I mean, that's a lot of acid you had to buy probably to be yeah, able to soak that was, the uh, cinder I, I'd get about from a gallon of it. I'd probably get, uh, two batches of blocks. Okay. Wow. So then as far as the, right now it has, still has the water from the eaves trough flowing into the cistern, right? You still have flow from that? Like that's how the- Oh yeah, I still have it open. Um, and then I have a sump pump for automatic water changes when it does rain. Okay. So, so are you, is there a certain depth that you're trying to keep it at? Yeah. Uh, 16 inches. Um, and that's just for the two cinder block depth. Oh, okay. Um, so it's like right level with the cinder blocks. So the walkway, I could probably go eight inches higher, but the benefit versus the sketchy, unstable cinder blocks right. doesn't seem worth it. Uh, how how much water could it hold? Oh, yeah. it'll fill the full eight foot. Um, I think it's 17,000 gallons. Oh, wow. So you, it could actually hold everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, like that's something like down the road, I might do some other things with it. Um, right now it's an eel cave. Um, and I really do like the cave. Um, but in a year, maybe it'll be a swamp. Um, and then I'll add some gar, bowfin, things like that. Um, platinum alligator gar, our fish that's always been on my list. Um, but that's something else that no one can like feasibly keep besides like those select few people that have like arapaima ponds too. Right. Um, so I could grow out the alligator gar in my 500 and then put it down there. I just want to take a quick break to thank one of the sponsors of today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community that literally has thousands of different classes across many different domains. If you're looking to hone a skill or develop a skill, Skillshare definitely has a class for you. For me personally, the weakest part of this podcast was my ability to market. I had no marketing plan, no marketing vision. And even a couple months ago, you may have seen me post on Instagram that I was looking to hiring a marketing team to help me market the podcast. Recently, I had the epiphany that maybe this is a skill I should actually hone on my own and be able to develop and do it myself. And that's where Skillshare has come in. I'm currently doing the podcast marketing class by Amanda McLaughlin. It's been incredible. It's allowed me to lay out an entire marketing plan through these PDFs that she provides. And the short snippet classes that are very easy to follow have been incredibly helpful. Now for you, I'm going to call some of you out because I have said many times on the podcast that we need more high quality herpetoculture content on YouTube. And I I know some of you out there are capable of doing this, but I also know that one of the biggest hurdles to doing that is learning how to edit and film. That is where Skillshare comes in. There are so many easy to follow video editing courses and filming classes that you can take on Skillshare that will be very, very helpful for you. For the first thousand people that click the link in the description, you will have free access to Skillshare for an entire month. So I highly recommend going to check them out. As I said, you can learn video editing, you can learn how to take care of plants, you can learn podcast marketing. One thing you cannot learn on Skillshare is how to care for eels in your basement. And for that, you have to continue listening to this episode of the podcast. Yeah. And, and then as, as far as filtration you have, it looks like a sump hooked up in there or, or some sort of filter. Can, can you walk mm -hmm. through that? Yeah. So it's such a big uh, volume of water, like the entire process. And now that I've got uh, maybe a dozen eels down there, there hasn't been a drop of ammonia. Just the water volume is so big that the ammonia is not going to build up to like a dangerous level. Mm -hmm. People are like always going to comment that like my filter is un undersized and it is, it absolutely is. But my stocking is so light for 4,000 gallons um, that it, it keeps up no problem. Um, but yeah, I have a, a pond canister filter um, flowing into a 20 gallon sump um, and, I'll, and I'll fill that with more media. Um, but right now there's just a couple bags of carbon and ceramic rings in there and mm -hmm. a couple crayfish that I'm trying to breed. And so when you first started, it looked like you threw a couple fish in there just to test the waters, right? Just to see if, if life was, could actually maintain down there. Mm -hmm. That was a bad one to go viral. <laughs> uh, cause it's just me throwing goldfish in a hole in the ground. <laughs> yeah. Is that um, the first one that went viral? Yeah. That one got like, it's probably at 6 million views by now, but it, yeah, right away. Wow. Uh, like overnight it hit a million views and it's literally me throwing goldfish in a dark hole. I'm like, oh, but it's left. one of those weird things where you see the thumbnail or like the, you know, the TikTok image and you're like, what the hell is that? It's like, yeah. look, it, it kind of looks like someone's about to throw fish into a hole. So I'm sure that's why it goes viral. I can justify it with context, but yeah, when you just watch the video, that's, that's not great. <laughs> Did you get lots of hate on that? Are people like, what the hell uh, are you doing? That one specifically, like just a lot of comments, like this is sad. Like, yeah, like, yeah it's well, give it, give it a month. <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. Because I didn't have a light in at that point. Like they, they're fine. Like the goldfish can totally hunt by scent. Like they, they're totally fine for the week they didn't have light. Um, and more than anything, I did once. There's things you can't test for. Like I didn't know if the shingles would be toxic. I didn't know if there was something I couldn't detect down there with a water test. Right. Um, that's yeah. why I throw the goldfish down. Let's see what happens. It, and and they actually did everything fine. I can test is fine. Yeah. And the goldfish did fine. It seems like. Uh, they're still alive, most of them, besides the ones that eels have gotten. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. And and so tell me just about the process of posting this online. Obviously, you weren't expecting it to go viral. So you post that first one, and then suddenly there's this insane excitement building around it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so like the best content I do, I think, is my Instagram stories. Um, and TikTok was just a place for me to dump that. Like if you go way back on my TikTok, like there's, I think there's way cooler stuff than the eel pit on there. Um, but yeah, it was just a place to dump my Instagram stories where they wouldn't be completely forgotten. Um, and yeah, the eel pit is the one that just blew way up. Um, the first video got like a hundred thousand views the, of me just looking in the dark hole and like, Hey, if my new house comes with an eel pond, cool. Mm. Uh, then the next video was me putting the goldfish in. Um, and then like, like I said, almost overnight, that one hit probably a half million. Then the following week it added up to a million. Yeah. Well, um, and there's something about like you know, the anticipation of you getting the eels and build, you know, people love watching projects, right? Sure. Like every couple of days you added new features and you're working on it. So people love that aspect, but then also like the excitement of getting the eels. I think just people that don't keep fish or even keep exotics seem to be invested in it. Oh yeah. This is a sitcom for a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is blown, blown so far up. Like, like I said, like I was looking at like some of the other, aqu- like comparing my, my page to some of the other aquarium pages, like I'm double most of the, most of the popular aquarium pages. Yeah, because you're pulling um, in people who aren't aquarium people to watch. Exactly, which which makes me need to like go through the context of what I'm doing more, um, and that's something I've tried to do more. Um, like I said, the first like I did acclimate, like I did temperature acclimate the fish um, in that first video where I'm just throwing fish in a dark hole. Like I did acclimate them to it. I didn't just just pour them down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but now I need to go back and like add context to things more so then because I figured ah, eh, the people that see this will hopefully just ask in the comments and I'll tell them. <laughs> Right. But, uh, yeah. In a nice way, not just attack me. But you don't expect it to go crazy viral. And no, have to yeah, add context like, for six like million it. people. Yeah. And and so you did at the, when you first went down there. Yeah, it is pitch black. There's no lights. But now you've added uh, at least one light, I think. Yes, I have one permanent. It's like a like a warehouse bay light um, LED mounted to one side. Now, is that something that you have on a timer? Does it come on during the day and off during the night? Or do you uh, just turn it on to go down there? I tell people it's on a timer, but I just do it every morning and night. I oh, just okay. plug it in and unplug it. But yeah, yeah, I yeah. tell people it's on a 12-hour timer. It's something like that. <laughs> right. Yeah. You you are the timer. <laughs> yeah, I am the timer. That's how most of my setups, I rather have it that way, honestly, just so so it forces me to go look at everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, otherwise, I'm going to get lazy. Yeah, I, I talk about that a lot on the channel too. Like when you get into all those automation things, you know, misters, lighting, and then you you can just kind of turn off and you forget to like check up on things. So all of a sudden important. you haven't looked at your animal in a week. Yeah. 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 And you're like, oh shit, how can you look like that? With the cave scenario, how important is light for the species in there? I mean, because some of these animals would be in in the natural habitats with absolutely no light, I assume. Um. So honestly, fish adapt really well. I've found fish, but minnows, like creek minnows, two miles underground, no problem, thriving. Right. Um, all the fish I have in there aren't specific cave specialists. Nothing I have is. Um, that'd be like your blind Mexican cave tetras, the eyeless crayfish, stuff like that, that has no pigment. Um, but these are all like stuff that like most most freshwater sources in North America, I would even say, look like chocolate milk. Yeah. The fish aren't using eyesight often to hunt. And it's very specific circumstances where they are. Like the Ohio River, where I catch a lot of my fish. Um, looks like chocolate milk. Mm-hmm. Um, the eels themselves are like strictly nocturnal in the wild. They want cloudy water and they want to be under a rock while it is sunny out. Um, then they'll come out at night to hunt in pitch blackness. Um, same with the channel cats. Uh, goldfish and minnows are super adaptable. Um, I've had actually like Blackmore goldfish. They often, if you keep them like in a pond or something, they'll get their eyes chewed out by something someday. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they survive totally fine with no eyes at all. Um, so most fish in general adapt actually really well to total darkness. I'm not saying it's ideal circumstance and that's why I do have the permanent light down there, um, but they'll survive just about anything. Yeah. Well, it is interesting. I mean, it's so true. I mean, we have a bunch of rivers where I am and channel cats are really popular here and Mm -hmm. it is the same. I mean, 
the river, the river is called the red river for a reason because it's a sort of red mud and you, you cannot yeah. see through it at all. And I imagine the bottom where all the, the catfish are, it's pretty much pitch black, even in the exactly. daytime, like maybe there's some filtered light, but almost nothing. Mm-hmm. And that's, and that's another issue I've run into is people really humanizing the fish. Um, because like uh, their lateral line, that's another sense they use more than anything, honestly, mm-hmm. um, when they're existing in those cloudy or murkier waters. Um, like to us, it looks like a dark, cold hole. <laughs> To the eels, like that's best case scenario. Yeah, that's where they want to be. Mm-hmm. And, and, and temperature wise, you're not doing anything to maintain temperature, right? No, that's why I'm specifically doing cold water, North American species. Um, it's 71 water temperature this week. Um, when we started, it was about 40 degrees outside. The water down there was about 50 degrees. So I expect it to level out somewhere in the 40s in the winter and then 70s in the summer. And obviously um, that's completely fine. They're outside anyway. Yeah. And that's actually really takes the edge off either extreme. Um, like in the wild, these eels could, I mean, honestly live in zero degree water or 90 degree water. Mm. Um, the eels are super adaptable. Goldfish are super adaptable. Channel cats are super adaptable. Um, so this actually like, honestly, like takes the edge off either extreme to just like a nice middle ground where they'll be totally healthy. Were there any challenges with setting up the cistern into a, basically a pond? Honestly, like, not really. Um, the just moving the supplies. It's a lot of cinder blocks. Uh, now it's a lot of gravel. Uh, it's probably five hundred pounds of gravel I've moved by hand. Um, what what's just you use like, for gravel? Just just sort of like rant, like just you know classic outside like driveway yeah, type gravel. Yeah, uh, pond gravel. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Which uh, that'll buffer the pH some, but not like like I said, the, the eels are super adaptable. They can be found in full salt water, so they can take those higher pHs. Mm. Um, and all the other fish are super adaptable too. Um, just not the extreme that the cinder block would drive it to. And, and then for those who are just listening, I mean, maybe we should have done this earlier, but can you just v- describe visually what it looks like? You know, you have this basically square pit and you have the cinder blocks for a walking path and then gravel. I'll just let you kind of just quickly run through what it looks like yeah. for people. Yeah. So it is a 22 foot by 12 foot room, eight foot high, top to bottom. Um, there's 16 inches of water. The entire left side is graveled currently. Um, with like big, like pond gravel, gravel. Um, then there is like a, I think it looks really cool. The cinder block walkway, um, out to another cinder block Island where I have a lawn chair. Um, so you come down this wood ladder that we built and I'm going to improve that eventually, um, onto a cinder block Island. Then there's the walkway on the right, uh, L's into another Island. Um, and then the people are also like saying like, where's all the hiding places? I'm adding that. I'm going to add, uh, rocks next week. I was waiting to get all the journalists in, then I can start working on it again, stir everything back up. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there'll be more hiding spots, but the eels and stuff, uh, the catfish, they all hide in these cinder blocks. They can go through the cinder block islands. Um, right. and that's kind of why I did that too. And so I'd have this giant open area, but also everything can hide in the islands and on the walkway underneath everything. Yeah. There's, there's tons of places. There's tons of hiding there's, spots. Like yeah. it looks, it looks empty. It looks bare, but no, everything you see is a, is a hiding spot and the eels actually burrow under the gravel too. So yeah, everything in there's a hiding spot. Well, it's, it's, it's kind of funny because, because it's such a large space, it will look more barren, even though the hiding areas are massive, but they're massive mm-hmm. inside a giant enclosure. So it looks like, Oh, there's look at all this open space. Yeah, but, exactly. And like the eels like to be like crammed into the smallest spot possible. Like, like that, that Island alone is like, hiding in hiding spot enough for all dozen eels. Mm. Um, you, you would never know. Like, like if I, if I have the lights on and I go down in like the center of the day, like I won't see an eel. They're just all hidden. Right. Yeah. 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 And so let's talk about getting the eels. Obviously that was like, we're talking about, there's the, the anticipation of you going to get them and where did you source them? Cause I think they're wild caught, right? Yes. Um, eels can't be bred in captivity. Um, so they came from a guy up in Maine who kind of supplies like biological specimens, aquariums, stuff like that from cold water, uh, main species. Um, I wanted the largest eels I could find. Um, and he was the first result on Google, honestly, uh, tied full <laughs> Tim. Uh, but yeah, I've been in contact with him for, it probably took him a month to get me all of them. Um, and I actually plan on getting a couple other things from him later this year. Some other so cool so they can't be bred in, in captivity just because of the conditions they need to be kept in or. Uh, yeah. So eel biology is really cool. Um, it's the, uh, the genus is Anguilla, um, which is basically just your river eels. Um, so your classic American eel, uh, they're like the most standard eels you can imagine, like American eels, European eels, uh, the Japanese eels, um, the New Zealand giant long fin eels. Those ones are crazy. They get like six foot. Um, wow. but they all, um, live in freshwater rivers and streams and then migrate back out to the ocean to breed and die after a certain amount of time. 
Um, the American eels, I believe it's like 10 to 15 years. Um, the New Zealand longfin eels, it's like 60 or 70 years they'll live and then they'll go breed and die. Wow. Mm -hmm. But, uh, the cool thing about that too, is, uh, when you, when kept in captivity like this, the, um, uh, American eels actually live far longer and the European eels do as well. Um, there was a confirmed case of a European eel living to 155 years in a well. Um, so almost identical setup. Um, the American eels can live about 80 years at least that we know. Like, like that's, a, that's the other thing. Like what is the specifics? Like at least 80 years, but maybe the American ones can live 150 too. Well, I, am, I imagine the ones that are kept in cool, cooler water will live, uh, probably an extremely Definitely. long time. So, and that's so, probably why the, uh, yeah, the New Zealand eels are such long lived animals. W what's the deal with the one in the well? How, how does an, how does it, a, an eel end up in a well? Um, so that's, that was actually like a thing they would just do in Europe. Um, because they're super hardy and they don't need a lot of food, like, like a snake, super low metabolism. Um, so just the biology of them makes them perfect. They're air breathers. They can be, um, if the water's like stagnant. Um, and then if the eel dies, then you know, something's wrong with the water. Don't drink out of that well. Um, so okay, it was kind so of like, like a test a, animal. Um, gotcha. and then like they documented like 155 years ago, I put an eel in today and then <laughs> all those years later, it's like that eel's still there. Wow. Um, like it became like a legend, like a hundred years after, like, like this thing's at least a hundred. And then like it lived another 55 years after that. That's amazing. And who the hell knows what they're doing in the wild? I mean, it's, it's so, I mean, this is probably a species that doesn't have that much research behind it. I'm sure. Yeah, we're trying to fill in the blanks, but yeah, it's like the lifespan is so, they say like seven to 15 years, that's when they migrate out. Um, but then there's some in, there are like uh, American eels that are trapped in lakes that they just can't migrate out of um, that are probably, yeah, 80 years old in the Do wild. People, people eat American eel as well, right? Yeah, so that's actually one of the biggest threats to them. Um, the European eel specifically is the one that's crashing pretty hard, um, but they collect the uh, elvers or the glass eels. Um, when they're migrating back into the rivers and streams, um, they ship them all over to Asia, farm raise them, and then ship them back to supply sushi, restaurants, things like that. Right. Um, and that's one of like the biggest threats to the eels. As far as maintenance goes for you with, with, with the pit, because that's one of the, you know, when you have a, have to have a, a pond that's in a separate building that requires you to go down these wooden stairs to go do maintenance, I'm sure it could be somewhat cumbersome. Is that something you have to, I'm sure, I'm sure right now you're going down there every day just because it's novel and, and new, but eventually is that, will you have to be down there every day or? Uh, yeah, so I, I do. I'm, I'm down there a couple times a day now. Um, love it. It's a cool place to hang out. Um, and, and like I said, I explore caves in my free time, so. I might as well sit in the cave under my house. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's good Wi-Fi down there. Um, but yeah, no. So like long-term maintenance, um, nitrate is like, are you familiar with aquariums decently? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So nitrates build up over time. Um, and that's when you'll do a water change. Uh, nitrates from day one have tested zero. Nitrates have not built up at all since I've started. Um, and like I just said, I do get free water changes when it rains. I just pump the rainwater out and uh, easy done. Um, but I have a pump in, or I have the rain gutters in and I have a pump out. Um, so my water changes are pretty much automatic. And if I do want to do one, I can just drop a garden hose in. Right. Um, so all that's pretty automated. Um, the lights dim enough. I'm not worried about algae at all. Um, so there really isn't much maintenance to it. Um, what about feeding? Yeah. And, uh, so I actually did put a, put like a uh, glass food bowl down there. Um, so I can start training the eels to come to that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I can just throw that down from the surface, kind of just chum the water with it. Um, right now I'm feeding them worms. I'm going to switch them to tilapia fillets here soon. And how often do eels need to eat? Uh, I'm going to feed them two or three times a week. Okay. Uh, eventually right now I'm feeding daily just to get them, get them used to me, get them as friendly as possible. Um, and I'll probably do that for the next month. Um, but yeah, long term, I'll feed them two or three times a week. What they can get by on, if I fed them once a month, I bet they'd live and wouldn't even look skinny. Yeah, yeah. Um, you could go on a trip and, and come back two yeah. weeks later and there'd be no issue. Not not even, yeah, not even notice a difference. Um, but yeah, I plan on feeding a couple times a week. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so I know you also talked about doing uh, adding some extra spe different species into there as well. So what other plans do you have to, to add to the mm -hmm. pond? Yeah, definitely. Um, so one of the coolest fish and one of the like most unique, like, it'll work in this circumstance is a uh, burbot. Mm -hmm. Nobody's really keeping them. They're actually like a species of freshwater cod, but they got it like a cool snake skin pattern. Uh, they have a little antenna on their chin. Um, they're kind of like a snakehead fish, yeah. um, but they're native to the U S. Um, so that's a really cool, unique, specific one that I could do. Um, 
I'll, I'm gonna get to like the next planned species is albino channel catfish. Um, I'll probably pick up three or four of those um, just because it'll stand out real cool. But I'll probably put a couple big goldfish, a couple koi, um, normal stuff. I want as much like biodiversity as I can down there. Um, so I want as varied amount of fish as I can. I'll probably put a school of like big like creek chub minnows um, just because they get like eight inches. So big enough not to get eaten by the eels, but they'll be mm-hmm. they'll school nicely. Um, there's a couple cool European species that make it into the trade, like the uh, golden orf minnows. It's kind of like a golden trout um, when they're big. Um, but yeah, nothing like specific that I'm looking after, just any cool oddball North American species. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we have burbots. Is, is that what burbot? Burbots? Burbot, and, yeah, yeah burbots burbot in, uh, in Manitoba. That's where I live in Canada. So those, you mm-hmm. know, those are all over the lakes and people are generally kind of creeped out by them. So it would be kind of cool to see one kept in captivity because you definitely never see that. Exactly. That's such an oddball fish that... They actually just became available for like the first time to aquarists this year uh, by Jonah's Aquarium is the company. They supply native fish, um, leopard burbot. They look insanely cool, but they're a hundred bucks a piece and I'd probably want to get three of them. Yeah. Yeah. How much were the eels? Uh, they were not bad. They were uh, 25 a piece. Oh, that's not bad. But they use them as bait fish. That's the thing. Like, that's the thing. Like, oh, it's sad. Like people aren't, they're not going to be able to breed. And it's like, well. Most of my aquarium fish aren't going to get to breed either. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's such a long lived species and they're like still harvested for food and bait, fishing bait. Like if people can jam a hook through them, I should, I should be able to keep one as a pet. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like you said, they were going to be kept as they would have been sold off as, as bait anyway. So yeah, food or fishing bait. Yeah. Well, and I think one of the things that you did that was clever as far as the viralness of this whole story was naming them because people, people who are not fish keepers are, they get attached to the name, right? For people who are more, you know, exotic animal keepers, we're just obsessed with like the actual setup and how it looks and and all the, you know, the inner workings, but people that aren't, they just want to have the names. (laughs) Mm -hmm, For sure. Yeah. That's something I didn't, I didn't plan at all for. Uh, my only named animal is my sulcata tortoise, Hercules and my Australian lungfish mango. That's the only animals I have named. Um, but yeah, when I did the, uh, announcement video where I had footage from the guy in Maine, he sent me of the, uh, eels, um, people just started naming them in the comments and they were really funny. So I was like, well, we're doing this now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's part of it that it's, it's, like I said, it's turned into a sitcom for people on TikTok. Yeah. So, so how, what are you going to do to keep it going? Obviously it's good to keep it going. Cause it's going to give you opportunities in the future to have, you know, this many eyes on, on your content. Are you just going to continue mm-hmm. documenting what you're doing or, or what do you, what are your plans? Yeah, I'm hoping people look at my other content. Um, I think that's way cooler stuff. Um, like my Florida Everglades trip, that was crazy. Seeing all the invasives down there, catching agamas, um, basilisk lizards, all kinds of stuff down there. Um, so I hope they look around at all the stuff I'm doing. Um, but I, I, I'm not going to stop working on the eel pit at all. Um, like I said, um, it's a cave now. In a year, maybe I will get better lights and turn it into a swamp. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe I'll do bowfin if you've seen those, bowfin and gar. Mm-hmm. Um, I do want like predatory, primitive, oddball fish. That's specifically what I like. Um, I get a lot of people asking for bass and it's like, it's, if it looks like a fish, it, I don't want it. <laughs> yeah. Like, you want bass, snake things. Blue, yeah. I want, I just want weird stuff. Like gar look like a crazy crocodile fish. Yeah. Um, bass just look like a fish. Yeah. I wanted like, what, like that's like keeping a tilapia. It's, it's all right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's what makes it unique is that it, you know, you have <laughs> sort of this interesting species. So, so what would take it from a cave to a swamp, obviously adding more lighting, what, what, what else would have to change to, to be more of a swamp ecosystem? For sure. Plants. That's, that's a big one. And that's one a lot of people are asking for, but a lot of that's not coming from fish keepers. Like it's, I don't, well, I, I do run plants in some of my aquariums, but like not intentionally. I just got free plants. I'm like, yeah, hey, I'll throw them in there. Um, it's totally possible to run an ecosystem without plants. Um, yes, as long yeah. as you do the water changes, if nitrates ever do start to build up, um, water changes and the cycle is complete. You don't absolutely need plants. Mm. Um, but that, that, that would be something, um, get better lighting It'd be cool to do like, uh, water lilies, uh, water hyacinth, water lettuce, stuff like that. Just some floating plants. Um, I'd love to do, uh, like a uh, Val, Val, jungle Val mm. across the bottom. Um, stuff like that. So I would consider it one day, but right now I'm enjoying the cave. Yeah. Well, plants always add more maintenance and plus you'd have to have way more light, obviously. Exactly. It's just a lot of work for not that much benefit to me. I'm keeping it for the species that I like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not worth doing it for the TikTok guy that's never heard of fish before. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Like I want to keep oddball fish, not, not plants. Could you put stingray in there? Uh, Too cold. 
Uh, too way cold. too cold. Um, my 500 gallon uh, aquarium, I may do freshwater stingers. I've had them in the past. Love mm-hmm. them. Um, I think I want to do Hystrix stingray. They're one of the most, the smallest available species out there. How big do they get? Uh, the Hystrix specifically stay under 12 inches usually. Oh, okay. Um, they sometimes rarely a big female get 15 inches, but that's absolutely massive. I've seen full grown, fully developed males that were maybe, maybe seven inches. Okay. Wow. And that's fully, fully developed, probably six, seven years old. That, that's another species that definitely would be more of a problem species, right? They are amazing, beautiful species and they, but they have such a specific care and they get really big. So some people are keeping them in most of them. Yeah. Most of them are a nightmare just on size. Yeah. Yeah. And they eat a ton, Mm -hmm. eat a ton and produce a lot of waste. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I saw on your channel or on your TikTok page that you, did you keep an electric eel or do you still have an electric eel? Yeah. He ended up jumping out. Um, yeah, I had an electric eel. It actually, uh, it was in Scientific American Magazine. They flew out. This National Geographic photographer uh, flew out to my my, my fish room. Um, yeah, I had an, I've, I've had everything. If you name off some fish, I'll tell you. I've had them and a bunch of facts about them. <laughs> so how, how does one get an electric eel? Is that something that would be wild caught as well? or Yes, wild caught, but they're just seasonal. Um, you talk to the right fish store, uh, they'll be able to find them. And, and how... Is it dangerous? I mean, I know they can pack quite a punch, so maybe you can talk a little bit about how actual electric <laughs> electric they so, are. So, and let me like say this too: like electric eels are a very, very specific thing. Like, I'm getting a million questions about what happens if I fall in my pond. It's like, I get wet. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm not. Yeah, they're not electric eels. Oh, people uh, electric, think the American eels are electric eels. Uh, people think every eel-like fish is an electric eel. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they. Uh, so. Yeah, electric eels are one specific fish. They had actually just got broken up into three species. Um, they're a knife fish. So if you've ever seen like black ghost knife yeah. fish, clown knives, they're in that family. Um, the New World knife fish down in South America. Um, yeah, knife fish. There, it just got broken up. I think in 2019 into three separate species. Um, the small ones are harmless. Um, if it's under four foot, it'll shock you. It'll hurt, um, but it's not going to do anything. The risk is when they're like you know six, seven foot. And you're in muddy water. It shocks you and you're being shocked. So you just sit there and drown. Um, like wow. they've, they've killed horses in the wild um, when you're like trying to cross like a muddy creek. I didn't realize they, they also, get so big. Oh, they get massive. Yeah, there's there's some huge, I, I, I want to say seven foot, I, for sure six foot. I, I know there's six footers out there. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And something I, like that will definitely kill you. Yeah, I mean, you, you're just shocked until you drown. Yeah, yeah. If you can't get away from it, then that's it. Mm-hmm. I, I do like the concept of keeping native fish. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I haven't been in the aquarium hobby for a long time, so maybe this is happening more so, but I, I love the look of like black water and, and aquariums and sort of dark tannin rich water. Mm-hmm. And so are people doing that a lot more like keeping North American species? I mean, one of the challenges is how big most many species get, right? Yeah. Well, no, uh, like you got to Google this one, just rainbow darters. Like there are these small stream fish that stay four inches that have more colors than some saltwater fish. Really? Um, in, in, in our backyards. Yeah. Uh, you're on Eastern side of Canada. I'm right in the middle. Okay. There, there's probably some darter species in your area um, okay, that would blow cool. your mind. Wow. Um, yeah. Here in Kentucky, definitely rainbow darters, variegate darters. And they're like reds, like vivid reds, oranges, blues, greens. Um, just all different colors and they're small species. They just need like a 20 long aquarium with some good current through it um, and well oxygenated water. Um, but I, I honestly, I think native fish keeping has become less popular over the years. Um, I've always like, there's fascinating species though. Like sculpins are another fun one. Um, what's Mad that? Tom catfish sculpin is like, have you ever seen a toad fish? Um, I don't know if I've seen a toad fish. Yeah. They're like just a little brown fish, their eyes on top of their head. They oh, just okay. Wait, okay. Wait for food. Yeah. 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 Um, cool. They're really cool. Sculpins, Mad Tom catfish. There's little North American dwarf catfish um, that max out at three inches. And they look like a like a, a small channel catfish or something or like a flathead catfish. They're just this big. Um, cool. So there's all kinds of species. But like to get them, you just got to go get them yourself. Right. So is there any I guess there's no rules or regulations, I guess not in Kentucky about keeping native fish. I'm not sure about where um, I am, but. There's, there's like certain, like, don't touch the arrow darters. Don't touch this darter. Don't touch that darter. Cause they are like, some of them are for sure vulnerable or they're only in one stream here and there. Um, but no, I mean, if literally people use rainbow darters as bait fish. So right. if you can put it in a bait bucket, you can keep it in an aquarium for sure. Mm. Um, fishing license. And that's about all you need. And then as, as far as the eel pit goes now, you have, I think you said 12 eels. Are, are mm. there any behavior issues? Like, are you dealing with any combative behavior or anything like that? 
Um, so they're really not well documented in captivity. There's a couple old forum posts. They say they're like aggressive towards each other um, in certain like territorial in certain circumstances. I think my space is just so large that I'm not going to run into that issue. Mm -hmm. um, but like the other night I walked down there and there's three of them like wedged as close as they can be in this one hole. So like with just their heads coming out of the cave. And, it's, well, and they're fine. They're, yeah, they're, they're not too territorial then. Are you um, able to sex I, them? Uh, so no, that's something with the, well, kind of honestly. The, so for the longest time, that was a mystery too, because they don't actually grow reproductive parts until they migrate back out to sea. Um, but if you see an eel over three foot, it's a female, uh, males usually stay around 18 inches. Okay. Um, so, so with that you can, um, but they don't actually like, there's no physical way to tell until they migrate out. Like that was a huge mystery for like the last hundred years. And so I wonder how much information you're going to be able to pull from this sort of experiment, because like you said, people aren't really keeping them in captivity and I don't, there's probably nobody keeping them in captivity as in a, such a large tank or a large pond like you, there's probably a good opportunity here for you to actually document some interesting things in captivity that no one else ever has. Mm -hmm. And I for sure, yeah, I'll be uploading videos. I'll, I'll do some longer format YouTube videos on what I notice. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know how, how novel of a, of a thing it'll be. For sure it'll be unique, but I don't know. I think behavior wise, they're, they're a fish. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You may not, there may not be anything Mm -hmm. interesting to document rather than just you no know, general yeah. behavior. I, I am more interested in, in like the guy there, there was someone I saw that had like, he got like five of them for a 200 gallon aquarium. And he said they, they were killing each other. They were so aggressive. Interesting. Um, and, and like I said, I haven't noticed any of that. Um, like sometimes it looks like there's like one got bit, but it's actually just the silt sticking to it. So where it's discolored, um, all my eels are like not a rip fin on any of them. So, mm. and that might just be because of plenty of hiding spots, plenty of space that they can all spread out. Yeah, it might be one of those things where they really probably shouldn't be kept in captivity unless you have something like you have. I mean, if you're mm -hmm. putting them in a tank where they can, you know, s there's light coming from all angles, they're probably going to be very uncomfortable. They're maybe not going to be able to have a good place, dark place to hide. And, and yeah, challenge. that's another another thing with them for sure is that, yeah, hiding spots and dim light is what they like. And, but it seemed like coming from the wild into, into cap a captive setting, they took to feeding fairly quickly. I know I had seen one video where you were trying to tong feed kind of maybe in the first day and there wasn't interest, but that's, but then it seemed like maybe the next day they were already eating for you. Yeah. Out of my hand. Um, and that's something that really surprised me. So I see the videos of like the New Zealand eels, same genus. So I pretty much identical care, I would assume. Um, but those ones have been trained over years. Um, and, but, but then there's like the river monster episode where he just sits in a lake with lamb's blood on him and they all start coming up. Um, I read one forum post because that's where all my eel information is really coming from on captive care is uh, an old forum post from 2009. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one guy. So one guy said they were aggressive. Um, someone else said it was like the most boring fish he's ever kept. They're so shy. He said it just buries into the mud and he never sees it like buries into the sand and he, he's seen it like twice since he's got it. Yeah. Um, so that's something I really worried about. It was like, Oh, here's a dozen eels. Maybe I'll see one every, every once in a while. Um, but no, like, uh, I, every time I go down, I usually see at least two or three of them. Um, and then when I do see them out, I can put the food right in their face and they'll still smell it and come right up. Um, but over time as that develops, I think they'll become like when they hear me open the manhole, they'll be at the surface begging for food. Yeah. yeah. My, you, my I'm goal. sure they'll, they're going to learn pretty quickly when food's coming in. And I imagine that when it, it, when it's winter in certain areas, especially if the water's freezing over, do they, are they a species that will just bury themselves into the mud and, and hunker down for a winter season or? Like a turtle? Yeah, they're usually in, in bodies of water that are so deep that they don't even care. They're probably still feeding through the winter. Oh, okay. um, like I said, they're from Maine, these ones specifically, but they do range from Florida to Maine. So they're so adaptable that, uh, yeah, they'll survive just about anything. Yeah, well, it's it's an amazing project and I can't wait to see it evolve. And I can't wait to see you add new species and, and sort of see where, where it all goes from here. Do you have any immediate plans right now to, to continue working on it or are you just sort of maintaining um, it? Yeah. So my immediate plans, and like I said, down the road, we're going to do all kinds of stuff with it. Um, could be a swamp, could be a garden, bowfin pond. Um, but, uh, immediately, so I was waiting to get all the journalists in and out, um, before I stir all the water back up. Um, today after this video, actually, I'm going to get in there and finish putting gravel down to cover the entire pond. Um, the water's pretty clear right now. Um, but before the eels went in, it was crystal clear. Um, you, like I posted a picture when I got back from Florida, um, after I hadn't touched anything for, uh, five, six days, we were in Florida and, uh, people said, why'd you drain it? It's like, no, that's, 
that's the water. That's 16 inches deep. That's that's just how clear it is. Um, so once I put that gravel down, I think we'll get back to that how that clear. Um, so I'm going to get in there, stir it all up, put another layer of gravel around the edges. Um, and then I'm also going to put down some flat rocks in the center um, because the, because the eels hide under the center blocks. When I put food in the center or like out in the open where I want to see them swimming and stuff, um, they don't really come out as much. So I'm going to put hiding spots right in the center, like natural looking rock shelves and stuff right in the center. So hopefully then they'll come out right to the food bowl and eat right in front of me. I, I guess you're also limited to the the size of the manhole, right? I just, I just thought of that just now, like you can't, you can only get stuff through that hole. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be, I think 19 inches wide. Okay. Um, but that's big enough for most, most anything I'd put down there. Yeah. But it, it is funny how, so when you're saying you, you wanted to, you know, wait for the journalists to come in and out, did you have actual people coming to your home to take photos and, and whatnot? Yeah. So I had the local news, the Cincinnati Enquirer came today and then I had someone from NPR, um, also, uh, just today, that was actually what was, uh, just before this, um, came down, took pictures, uh, the inquirer did, I think they're going to do a video story along with the article. It's incredible. So it's just going to continue to build. I'm sure over the next month or so, as all the journalists come in, take your pictures, this interview, things like that, that are just going to slowly add to it. I'm hoping, I'm hoping like I make something lasting out of this. Um, I, like I've been trying, like I've been trying for years. I, like I said, my, uh, YouTube content goes back to high school. Um, so, and I think there's some great stuff on there. Um, my stingrays, I documented all that. When we first got my female Indian star tortoise as a two week old baby, she's on there. Um, so I, and that's what I, why I like really did it is I don't know what I'm going to do with my life, but I'm going to see cool animals while I do it. So I'd like yeah. to have a record of all of them. Yeah, no, that's amazing. It, well, you can definitely turn into something, you know, you're, you're going to have lots of eyeballs on the content. So hopefully you can continue to work with it. And, and as, as far as the Indian star tortoise, cause that's a pretty rare animal in captivity, if I'm not mistaken, I, I don't see them in Canada almost ever. H- how did you acquire the first one? Uh, so that was just luck. Honestly, um, I worked at a pet store and then, uh, there was a long term, long time customer that I hadn't met yet. Um, and he actually just had babies hatch out from his, um, but he, he was breeding radiated tortoises. He was breeding, uh, a lot of rare species. Um, right now he's, he's downsized to just a pair of lychee geckos. Mm. Um, but yeah, he's, he's got all kinds of amazing species. Um, he had Egyptian tortoises at one point. Oh, wow. um, so yeah, he just happened to have, uh, two Indian star tortoise babies and, uh, we bought the female from him hatched for female. So we went, me and my brother went in half on her. Um, cause how much was they're, they're not cheap. Uh, so when we got her, she was 400. The price has increased since. Okay. 400. That's not bad. I was expecting a mm-hmm. thousand. No, I, like if we were going to sell our full grown female, I'd probably want 4,000 for her. Okay. Yeah. 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 No plans to sell. She's, she's printing money right now. <laughs> yeah. And it's a beautiful uh, but, species, but, right? Oh, they're amazing. Yeah. They're one of the most amazing tortoises in the world to me. Um, and we do want to like try to get the permits to get radiated now from this. Oh, you need permits for that. Uh, the radiateds are uh, on the U.S. Endangered Species Act. Um, okay. The real issue, if they, if someone had them still in Kentucky that I knew, I could probably buy them within the state, but taking them over state lines would be a crime. Right. Um, okay. Without the permits. And it looks like you're keeping lots outside. Um. Right now, just our Greeks and star tortoises. They're actually right below me. Um. We're gonna put our sulcata out once we build her pen. Um. And that's all for now. And I'll probably do another fish pond somewhere in the yard. Yeah. So you got lots to, lots of space to have those projects expand. And, and, and then mm-hmm. w- one other thing I was, but as we're wrapping up, it looks like as a job, do you, are, are you working for a company with that's associated with aquariums or caring for people's aquariums? Yes. I sometimes see um, videos of you doing like really cool client videos. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've worked in uh, pet stores my whole life. Um, yeah. You probably saw the 600 gallon I maintain. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I've got a couple customers. Uh, yeah. I just always manage. I'm actually between stores right now. I'm switching over to, uh, to manage a freshwater section at a local store. Oh, cool. Awesome. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like you've surrounded yourself with animals and you're just having fun carrying and, and recording Seriously, what you're man. up to. It's, it's wild how well my, my life has gone. <laughs> well, that's the thing is like sometimes, I shouldn't say sometimes, I think a lot of times that people just pursue what they're interested in, things will mm-hmm. open, the doors will open in ways that you wouldn't expect. Yeah. I originally wanted to be a biologist. Um, then I couldn't do the math classes. I failed chemistry twice, uh, switched to a media degree. Um, graduated with that and then just, yeah, stuck with the fish the entire way. Yeah. Well, there's so much pressure to go to university, get your degree, do your thing when, when really it's like, you know, 
you have a passion for caves and a passion for keeping animals and you've somehow married those two things and now had the world is just fascinated by it. And, and I'm not surprised because it's just so unique and so interesting. So it's, it's really, really cool. Is there anything that we didn't say today that you wanted to, to say before we officially wrapped up? I think we almost covered it all. Yeah. Uh, I also have a big interest in animal evolution, but no, I think we covered all of it. Is, 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 is there something, what about animal evolution just in general, just from, uh, that's, that's like probably my main interest with all this is like the species I go after is like, I'm actually getting uh from the same guy that supplied the eels. Have you ever heard of a hagfish? Yes. Yeah. They're that's like that really like ugly looking thing, right? Really ugly deep sea fish. Um, they're like the, like right at the edge of what is a vertebrate even, um, there, uh, then there's lancelets, which is a stage under them, which is like a filter feeding worm. So then it goes to the hagfish. Then I've had lamprey before, the sucker mouth, blood sucking fish. Yes. Um, I had those in an aquarium this year. Um, the Australian lungfish, that's why they're such an amazing species, is they're a lobe finned fish, the four paired limbs, the true lungs. They, they act and look more like an amphibian. Mm. Um, just like the difference between fish families, too. Um, because like the lobe finned fish, so like the lungfish, um, comparing the lungfish to a fish is like comparing a frog to a lizard. Um, is the right. evolutionary difference. Um, so it's like birds to reptiles is lobe finned versus ray finned. Interesting. Um, so, so that, so that's the context really of that is my real fascination with everything. Is yeah. The yeah. Context so, of evolution. So, so you have that, you, there's a passion in, in seeing basically life come up, you know, st start to develop those early vertebrates, those early fish. Seeing and, the branching of it all. Yeah. Um, well, especially because there's actually. examples, like those are still exist on the earth. It's and not like fossils. And that's the most, most fascinating stuff. That's why I spent a lot of money on that fish is just, that's like, that's, that's the one that's the literally like the, the, the mixture of amphibians and fish. So cool. Mm -hmm. as, as, and keeping lamprey, like what do you feed a lamp? But for anyone that's not familiar with those, those are sort of like blood suckers, right? They'll sort of attach to things. And so the common ones are the well-known one, the sea lamprey is, okay. um, the species I kept specifically is a brook lamprey. Um, so those live four or five years as you wouldn't even think it's a fish. It looks like an earthworm, um, with like eye sockets, not even eyes. It just has eye sockets at that point. Um, so it's a really ugly looking thing. Um, then they turn into what looks like a lamprey. Um, yeah, they got the eyes, they really dumb looking with their sucker mouth. Um, <laughs> but then they live two weeks, they breed and die. So they're a filter feeder their entire life. Wow. Turn into the adult form that looks like what you would expect, um, breed and die. Um, the other ones, and I'm hoping to keep a parasitic species later this year or whenever I can get a hold of one. Um, there's this, the sea lampreys are super illegal cause they're so invasive, super illegal to transport over state lines, but there are native ones here in Kentucky, um, that I'll be able to get chestnut lamprey, um, a bear or silver lamprey is the other one. Cool. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. And yeah, it is really cool to get a window into those early evolutionary years and, and sort of foster that. So no, that's, that's cool. Well, Nick, I had a blast chatting with you. This is such a cool story. I'm so happy that you actually not only are doing this project, but also, you know, recording it and pu publishing content for people to see. Can you let everybody know where they can find you across all the platforms? Yeah. So, um, my TikTok and YouTube are cow turtle. I kind of, everything probably starts on TikTok, then I'll repost it everywhere else. Um, someday I'll do long format YouTube video, just going down breakthrough of everything. Um, and then everything else I think is cow turtle nine, four, two, seven. Um, but if you just search cow turtle on everything, I'm sure I've gotten big enough that I'll come up. Yeah. Yeah. Just Google cow turtle. Like I said at the beginning, it's, it's a name that you wouldn't have chosen if you were going to go viral, but it's, I think it works perfectly because it's just obscure, like the projects you're working on. So it, it's great. And I, I think you do have a lot of potential for doing some long form YouTube content as well. I think people will really be fascinated by that. So hopefully that's something you do. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to. It's just the, the effort it takes. And yeah, I have yeah. a degree in it and it's still like, ah, just <laughs> editing. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I, I, I hear you there. Well, Nick, thank you so much for, for taking the time with me today. Um, good luck with the rest of the project. Good luck with all the journalists and everybody that's contacting you. And I know myself and the listeners will be watching as everything progresses into the future. So thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah, no problem at all. All right. That is the end of that episode. Nick, thank you so much for dropping by and sharing that full story with us. Like I said, it's totally fascinating. When I first saw it on pop up on my Instagram reels, I was just like, I need to have this guy on because it's, it's so crazy. And it looks like it's functioning so well. I mean, if you go, if, for those of you that are listening, if you go to his Instagram or TikTok now, it is even more set up than it was by the time when we had this conversation. The water is crystal clear. There's a functioning filter and everything. And the eels seem to be doing really well. And I think there's going to be some more development in that area as well. So if you want to follow him, make sure you head to either the YouTube description or the show notes. You can find links to all the social media there. 
Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. If you did enjoy it, you can share it on any social media platform that really does go a long way to find more listeners. If you are looking for more information on this podcast or any other podcast on the network, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. Thank you so much to customreptilehabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Affiliate links are either in the show notes or on the YouTube description. If you do make a purchase, a small commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. And if you would like to join us on Patreon, you can do that at patreon.com slash animals at home. And that is it for this episode. I will see everybody next week.